allow children of all ages? Uh, so. Okay. So participants admit. Hello, children. Please stand by while we wait for three more minutes for the teacher to come and you know. Okay, everybody, welcome. Oh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How's everybody doing today? Good to see you. Good to see you all. So today we have a topic, which um, it's a bit of a reality check type of a topic. This topic that we're going to talk about today is about contemplating death. Okay. Ah, can you? Okay, good. I thought I was on mute. Can you hear me? So we're going to talk about contemplating death, and there is good material here in Rising Soul. There's also really good material from the Hamza Yusuf book, and so we are going to talk about both contemplating death and obliviousness to blessings. Those, those topics. Okay, so um, those of you who are following along, we are on page 225 on the chapter about contemplating death. And so death, uh, you know, we're all alive, right? Like why do we need to contemplate uh, death? Well, as Muslims, we know that we believe that death is a very important part of life. It shapes our beliefs, it shapes our feelings, it shapes uh, you know, the way we go about life. And what it says at the beginning of this chapter is that contemplation of death and thinking about your future in the next life is a powerful means of softening the heart and growing closer to Allah, which is our first Kahoot question, okay? So when you think about death, what is the effect of that? It softens your heart and you grow closer to Allah when you think about death, okay? And so as you know, um, the heart that we have inside, it can change, it can grow harder, it can grow softer, and you can tell how your heart is doing by the way that you experience and react to things. If you are accepting, if you are accepting Allah's guidance and the guidance of your elders and doing the right things, um, if you are responding to things correctly and it's like easy for you to do the you know uh, commandments of Allah, the the worship, the you know sacrifices that you have to do. Probably your heart is soft. Probably it's in a healthy place. But if you find that um, it's very difficult to do those things, then it is very possible that your heart is in a harder place. And how do we get our heart to be in a softer place? We contemplate death. We remember death often. And remembering death, um, as Allah tells us, it helps us grow closer to Him. Okay, the prophet said, and here's another Kahoot question. The prophet said, increase your remembrance of the eliminator of pleasures, the eliminator of pleasures. So what is he talking about? He's talking about death because death is the eliminator of pleasure, right? So all these fun things that we get to do in life, you know, you go to a theme park, you go shopping, you go hang out with your friends and family. As soon as you die, what happens? You can't do those anymore, right? So it's the eliminator. It just stops you from doing all those things. And that's what he means. Another Kahoot question. The prophet also said, be in this life as a stranger or a traveler. Be in this life as a stranger or a traveler. So a lot of times what we do is, and, and, and you know, it's not always a bad thing. When, we, when we're growing up, we think, you know, we need to, we do need to do all those good things. Like we need to make good grades try to get a good job, try to make, you know, a nice house for ourselves, a nice life for ourselves. These are true because we do need to do those things to live a life, a halal life, the kind of life that um, would fulfill our needs. And that's a very good thing. But uh, at the same time, sometimes we, we put too much uh, value on this life to the point where we think that this is a permanent place. We think uh, we treat this life as if it's a permanent place. And then what? 
And then we may transgress Allah's boundaries. We may forget Allah because we're working so, so hard to make this life a permanent place. Or maybe we are willing to do anything to get that house. Like maybe we have worked hard to get that house and now we want the biggest, nicest house for our family. So then what? Then in order to get the biggest, nicest house, we're willing to use an interest loan. You know, we're willing to miss uh, Salat al-Jummah. We're willing to, you know, we're willing to sell alcohol in our business. Why? Just to get that money because we feel like we need the biggest house. Why? Because we feel like this is like the final home. It is not really the final home. If we behaved like this place was a, a temporary place, which it is, and we behaved like we were travelers, then what would happen? Then we are going to realize that we don't need to uh, compromise ourselves in our religion, right? We would realize that this is not a permanent place. So if you think about the times that you've traveled, everybody's gone on vacation, right? What do you do? You don't pack up everything in your house. You just fill a suitcase, right? So you just put something in a suitcase. And if you go, you know, stay over an Airbnb, a hotel, resort, whatever, you go to your cousin's place, you go to another country. If everything there is not totally perfect, you don't kill yourself over it. You realize, you know, this is a temporary place. You know, if, if things are not exactly the way I want, the temperature is not exactly what I want, the food is not like perfect. We realize that's okay because this life is a temporary life, right? The prophet also told us, if it's the evening, do not trust that you will reach the morning. And if it's the morning, do not trust that you will reach the night. This is like a wisdom, right? This is like a wisdom. It's, um, th these are all uh, teachings that go into our perception of life and death that you know there are people who are so afraid of death and i hear about this because my husband will work in the hospital and he will tell me there's people who are even afraid to go to the hospital <laughs> because they're afraid so much afraid of death that they don't even want to go to the hospital because of you know they might catch corona if they even go in the hospital and you know and that's a norm maybe that's there's that can still be a normal fear but when you see people going crazy to the point where they're just like crazy like they you know maybe they're just locking themselves in you know in, in their house in their room not leaving because they're so attached to this life they're so afraid of death then you know that their perception of, of that this life is everything is, is what they believe like like they're so afraid of death whereas for a muslim you know we we do take our safety precautions but we accept death as a, as a reality of our life right so um so once again you know we're reminded here on this page 225 that if remembering death leads you into depression, despair, apathy, then your approach is incorrect. So, you know, we're not supposed to remember death like as if it's like making us sad all the time, but we're supposed to remember it as like a reality of our life. Also a very good hadith as well is take advantage of five before five. So the prophet told us to take advantage of five before five. This is from Ibn Dunya. What are these five? Your youth before your old age, your health before your illness, your wealth before your poverty, your free time before you become busy, and your life before your death. So these are five things that you should take advantage of. Because these, things go okay? these, things, these things do not stay. Okay, so uh, you'll always hear uh, your parents saying, oh, you know, when I was young and, you know, I had so much time or, you know, take advantage of this opportunity because it's not going to come back. And because your parents realize that, you know, you are at a time in your life where you should take advantage of your youth before you're old, you know, also your health. Sometimes we don't realize how good something is until we can't use it. So, um, health, like, have you ever maybe broken a bone or gotten sick? And then you're like, my goodness, you know, the simplest thing is hard for me. Like when you get that flu, and you know, maybe you get the tonsils and even something so simple like swallowing becomes so hard for you. That's when you realize that you should take, you know, uh, that we should take advantage of our health and be grateful for our health before we get ill. Your wealth before your poverty. And it doesn't mean that in life, you're always gonna keep increasing your uh, wealth. There are times when, you know, someone might get a higher paying job and then they get a lower paying job, right? And so if you have the wealth, take advantage of it, you know, buy the things you need, make the donations, do what you need to do because you may have a time when then you can't afford that anymore because of poverty. Also your free time before you become busy. So if we ever have free time in our life, don't waste it. Don't squander that free time, right? Right now with the lockdown, we had a lot of free time. You know, hopefully everyone is doing something good with their time. Also your life before your death, right? So there's, you know, as we know, we have to make the best use of our life before our death comes. Because once 
once death comes, it's going to be too late. So the prophet also said, two blessings which most people take lightly until they're lost is health and free time. Health and free time. And I think that, you know, when you're in your youth, you don't even realize what you have. You don't even realize the health that you have. You don't realize, you know, the, the time that you have. I mean, even for me, and I'm probably multiple times older than all of y'all. I mean, I look back, you know, my health when it was like 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I'm like, subhanAllah, I didn't realize what health I had back then. And even the free time, the older you get, the busier you get, the, the more responsibilities you have. And you keep thinking back to when you had free time, right? And you're like, wow, you know, I had so much time. You know, hopefully you do good things at that time. And that way you can remember in a good way and not have regrets, you know, and you can say, wow, mashallah, you know, um, I had time and I used it really well, you know, as opposed to when, once you get old and you say, you don't want to have that regret, like, oh, I had time and I just wasted it. You know, I wish I, I didn't waste my time. So we don't want to have that, um, that regret. And so um, that is actually the section out of this book, Rising Soul. A similar topic is in the Hamza Yusuf book. And um, I have this persistent little cough that keeps coming up, so you have to excuse me. <coughs> but I'm going to be um, going to the Hamza Yusuf book. And if you are on that PDF, there is a section on um, page 83. It's called Antipathy Towards Death. Antipathy. So Hamza Yusuf actually, when he talks about antipathy towards death, he is actually um, saying that this is a disease of the heart when you have antipathy towards death. And what does he mean by that? What he means by that is, he says on page, uh, you know, on page 83, he says, antipathy towards death is considered a disease of the heart. It refers to a strong aversion to death to the point that if it's merely mentioned, it causes consternation, okay? So have you ever, um, I, I mean, when I think back to like when I was in elementary school, we didn't have full-time Islamic schools back then. I went to like a normal public school here. Um, I grew up in Dallas. And, you know, if, if there is like a single word about death, like in the classroom, everyone is like, oh, oh my God, that's a scary, you know, like if, if it's like a, a, a literature, like if it's a novel and it, and it has death in it, everyone's like, oh my God, that's so spooky. You know, everyone's like so scared if, if there's like a current event and there's like death. You know, everyone like, you know, is like, wow, you know, that's death. Yes, those are, um, you know, those are normal reactions. But when it becomes to the point where you hate to remember death, like you hate it, like you're just like, oh my God, why did you bring that up? You know, that's so depressing, you know. Well, you know, a true Muslim doesn't have that attitude because death is really a part of our reality. It's part of life. And so if you, if you are faced with, with uh, hearing about death, um, you know, you take it in a mature way and you say, yeah, you know, we're all going to die. And really that should be just a reminder to us that, you know, as Allah says in Surah 3, verse 185, every soul shall taste death. Every soul shall taste death. There's not a single person you see on TV or the movies or YouTube or anything or any of those famous people who is not going to taste death, no matter who they are. Also, Allah tells us in Surah 62, verse 8, say, the death from which you flee will overtake you. Thereafter, you will return to the knower of the seen and the unseen. He will then inform you of all the things that you had been doing. So here we are, you know, we're warned that, that yes, as, as human beings, we do run away from death. We're not trying to like, you know, walk into death. I mean, nobody said go walk into like the highway or the four lane road. I mean, you know, everyone that you have to be safe, you stay away from death. But at some point, it's going to overtake you. And then what? Then inevitably we will return to who the knower of the seen and the unseen so all those things that are that we are hiding from the world or that are hidden from us everything is going to be open and it says he is going to inform you of all that you have been doing so allah is going to let us know what we have been doing okay allah is going to uh, open up all the secrets that we even uh, were unaware of even about our own selves and then we uh, we did touch upon this but in that first paragraph Hamza Yusuf says, when death is mentioned, it is considered a morbid talk. So, so this is this is the when we were talking about how um, antipathy towards death is a disease of the heart, this is a further description of that disease. Okay. So if you have that 
disease in your heart, then this is what happens, that when death is mentioned, it's considered a morbid topic that's uncouth to discuss. And when it's discussed, it's turned into some deadline before which people are supposed to squeeze in all their life's pleasures. The Muslim view is completely different. To speak about death is to speak about life and the urgency to live a faithful and wholesome life before death overtakes us. So it's just, you know, Hamza Yusuf is giving us like these two different attitudes that people have because the, the attitude that we have, the value system and the and the worldview that we have is different from the worldview that maybe other people who are not Muslim have. Other people want to get in every kind of fun thing. There are, I mean, you know, not everybody, but there are many people who want to get in every kind of experience they can before they die. You know, there are still other, uh, there are still moral people out there. But I mean, like for a Muslim, you know, when we, when we think about death, you know, we, um, we, we take it seriously and we have our own view about that, okay? He goes on on page 84 and he talks about the root of this disease, okay? The root of the disease of antipathy towards death is rooted in the excessive love of the dunya. The more one covets this world, the greater the sense of loss when he dies. So in other words, you remember we talked about attachments yesterday. So attachments, when you love this dunya too much, Okay, when you love this dunya too much, then uh, what happens is you can get a disease which is antipathy towards death. Okay, and so um, just going back to that paragraph, on the second paragraph of page 84 of Hamza Yusuf's, it says, Everyone will experience the loss of a loved one. When the Prophet ﷺ lost his son Ibrahim, he wept but also praised God, the source of life and death. People who believe in God and the afterlife handle death well. The same is true with calamities and tribulations. Okay, and so uh, you know the Prophet Sallallahu He also he had natural reaction when his son died. You know he experienced that loss. He he wept, but at the same time he kept it into perspective. And uh, Hamza Yusuf gives an example. He says Maurice Bouquel, the well-known French physician, said that when he attract what attracted his interest in Islam because he's a convert. What made him interested to be a Muslim was how his patients in North Africa, it says how North Africans in France, North Africans in France faced death. As a physician, he was exposed to diseases and death and he saw how different people handled death and dying. And so he, he saw how unique it was, how you know, the Muslim people were dealing with death when, when people died on front of them versus the other people. And this is actually what attracted him to become Muslim. And then um, the Prophet, in the next paragraph, the Prophet Sallallahu encourages believers to desire long life for two reasons, to make up for past sins or to increase good deeds. And so these are two reasons to uh, desire a long life. Otherwise, we know that if we were trying our best, we you know, we really gave every single moment to Allah and every single day to Allah, then we know that um, after death, inshallah, we'll go back to Allah in a good position. And so uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily want to stay in this dunya for very, very long, you know, uh, we, but two reasons that the Prophet gives us is to make up our past sins and to increase good deeds. Also, next paragraph, it says, the one who remembers death is ennobled by certain characteristics. One of them is contentment, and lack of covetousness, okay? So contentment we've talked about. A lack of covetousness means like they don't have those attachments, like they don't hold things too uh, strongly or too much. The Prophet ﷺ said, contentment is a treasure that is never exhausted. So honestly, um, if you're able to be content with what you have, this is like a treasure of a quality because you are not going to be wanting things, you know, all the time, everywhere you go. You're just happy. You're, you're alhamdulillah. You're content. And maybe you've come across people who are like that. You know, they're not always wanting the next thing. They don't always want the next, you know, desire. And I want more and I want this. Instead, they're just happy. In fact, they're able to even, you know, say no to things, you know, easily. So these are, um, these are some nice little gems uh, here out of this book. It says, the pro okay, so it says, he also prayed, oh God, provide for my family with what suffices them and grant them contentment with it, okay? So honestly, um, you know, and, and I, there's somebody that I know uh, who would make dua, literally that they don't have so much wealth that it leads them astray. They just want enough to keep them in the right path. And here, uh, that remind this hadith reminded me of that, but this hadith says that the, um, 
that the Prophet prayed to Allah just to provide his family with what is enough and to make them happy. Because honestly, just because you have Allah doesn't mean that you're content with it or that you're happy with it, right? Being content is a separate quality from what you have. You can have tons and tons and tons and yet you're not content, right? Or you can have little and you see people who are content with very little. So that contentment is definitely a value and a quality that we should all strive for because this is like a peace in your heart. This is like a, a treasure for us, okay? And then um, the next one, the wealthy soul is the one who is content. So in other words, richness is in your heart, right? It says this contentment is not the kind that originates from stupidity or not knowing any better. It is contentment that is informed by knowledge and by reflection on death and its meaning, okay? So what role does reflection of death have in your contentment? Because you just know the value of life and you know the value of death and you know the value, you, it's like you have this understanding, you know, this of, of what everything really is. Sec, it says, second, the remembrance of death gives one energy to achieve good deeds, right? So if you need motivation, you know, remember your death, right? Remember where we're all going to end up being and, and the fact that we have like that time right now. It says wealth and sons are the adornment of this world. So this one is a, is a Quranic ayah from Surah 18, verse 46. Wealth and sons are the adornment of the life of this world while enduring good deeds are better with your Lord in reward and better in hope. Okay, so wealth and sons, right? So wealth, all those dunya things that you can accumulate. Some of it monetary, some of it, you know, maybe um, not directly monetary, but all that wealth, the things of the dunya that we acquire, and sons, like, you know, your family and, and all, you know, that investment that you make in your children and, you know, your, you know that's what a normal, uh, the typical uh, thing is to do. Those are the adornments of this world. But you know what happens? As we said, the eliminator of pleasures comes, right? When death comes, none of that helps you, right? Your entire, that huge house that you worked for, you leave it behind. The cars, you leave it behind. Your jewelry, everything gets divided up. And the even the children that you worked so hard for, right? And it, sometimes, you know, we, we as parents even have to remind ourselves that even these children, yes, we have to do the right things to raise them. But if we don't do the right things ourselves, and one day even these children are not going to be there in our account anymore. You know, they're going to move on, right? After you die, it's just what you have in your own account that you save for Allah. Next, we have on the next page, let's see the obliviousness to blessings, okay? So this is something, um, it, it's actually the next section in Hamza Yusuf's book. What is obliviousness to blessings? It, it is, on, so I'm on page 85. It's a lack of understanding and acknowledgement, a nauseous disregard that whatever blessing you have is from God, okay? So this is mentioned in the Quran in uh, Surah 16, verse 53. So um, uh, in Surah, uh, let's see, yeah. So in the second paragraph, it says the Quran begins with the phrase, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And some scholars have said that Rahman implies the giver of major blessings, while Rahim implies the giver of subtle blessings that are not perceived until they're removed. Okay, so he gives the example after that about blinking. He says, we blink, for example, thousands of times a day, and there's people who cannot blink without putting water into their eyes, right? So it's all those little, little things uh, that are blessings for us, right? Um, the ability to walk in balance, the, you know, the ability for our heart to pump, muscles, you know, all these things are blessings that Allah has given us. Next paragraph, it says, while we cannot count our blessings, we are charged to be grateful for having them. So obliviousness to blessings is a is a sin or is a disease. It's a disease of the heart, of your spirituality. So once again, in your spirituality, in your heart, you have to be grateful for the blessings you have, whether that's blinking, your heart pumping, your health, your wealth, everything that you have, your family, um, all of these are blessings that you have to be grateful for because if you're not grateful, that means you're oblivious to them. And have you ever met somebody or noticed that within your own self that when you're oblivious, you know, have you ever met somebody who just doesn't, you, you look at them, you're like, they don't even realize what they have. You know, they have this blessing. They don't even realize that they have this blessing, you know, and you can tell from the way that they behave. It says uh, on the next paragraph, we cannot count our blessings. Uh, we're supposed to be grateful for them. So let man reflect on the food he eats. Indeed, we have poured down water in showers. Then we split and uh, we split the land in cleft and we caused to grow grain therein and grapes and fresh herbage, olive trees, date palms and dense orchards and fruits and pasture, all provisions for you and your, 
for your cattle. And that's in Surah 80, uh, verse 24 and 32. I'll tell you um, an interesting little thing. Like we, when asthma was, uh, when I had asthma in my tummy, uh, 2008, I happened to visit Jordan. We usually like to visit like different countries in the world. I had an experience there because we rented this apartment and we're all like showering, drinking this water and everything. And then suddenly, um, you know, the water doesn't turn on anymore. And we're all just like, hey, what's going on? And then we find out that in that, in that building that um, you only get like these four big, like huge canteens of water for the entire week. And we had like used it up in like one day because we're just like running the water. We take our showers, we drink, we're doing the laundry. And after that experience of running out of water in one day and not having that running water for like the next week, I never looked at water the same way again. And I know we've had things like that happen. Like, um, you know, I'll go to like Bangladesh or whatever. And like back when I was younger, the electricity would go out pretty often. Nowadays they've gotten like more generators and what, but when I was like younger, if you went to like a third world country, the electricity would just randomly go out in the middle of what you're doing. And I mean, like, it would be summer, you know, be hot. And then suddenly the fan stopped working. The electricity stops working or the light stops. Or like, I learned not to take showers at night because like if the lights go out at night, it's over. You're like in the shower, there's no lights. And so, you know, things like that makes you realize, <laughs> excuse me, the blessings that you have, you know, just being in this country and not having to worry about like your electricity randomly going out or like your water not finishing quickly. So these are just some little things that Sometimes you just don't have the life experience. In fact, that ties in with the next point where Allah tells us um, in Surah 8, verse 53, that God never changes any blessing he has bestowed upon a people until they first change what is in themselves. This is an extremely important point that we have to uh, work hard to um, you know, internalize and take in, that God does not change a blessing that he bestowed upon a people until they first change what is in themselves. And this is one of those things that it, um, uh, it takes a while for us to understand and really own this verse. Because when you're younger, you don't, you know, you're at that, you know, youthful age, all of you like that beautiful youthful age, you don't actually realize the layers and depths of things that you can do to change something in your condition. So, you know, I, um, you know, it takes that experience, like, you know, it took you know, that experience for me to go through the water um, experience or the electricity experience, right? Or, you know, um, maybe you have to move from city to city. So when I was, you know, I lived in a really, um, I was really blessed to grow up in a city with like an amazing, uh, amazing Islamic center. So then later when I moved to like the podunk little towns, I really missed like having a great Islamic center, having a really great masjid. So then what happened is once I moved back to like a city with a great masjid that always had lectures and community and things in English, you know, um, I, I just took advantage of it much, much more because you realize that you should be grateful for those things that you took for granted before, right? And so sometimes it just takes life experience, um, but you know, this is something um, that we have to do. We have to have gratefulness and we also need to realize that you know, um, wh when we're going through life, that we have to work hard to change our condition. That is what Allah is saying, that, that he will not change our condition until we, you know, take that realization and change uh, what is within uh, ourself. And so this is a just, it's a really important point that I wish I had the time to like go in depth into. But a lot of times that um, experience of maybe um, having something withheld from you, and then you have to be uh, you have to make that extra effort to then acquire th that same blessing, right? That helps you be more grateful for the original condition that you had, okay? So a uh, small example, you know, let's say you had, like, you lived five minutes away from a great monster there in Islamic school or something, and then you move away, like, 30 minutes away, and then it takes a lot more effort for you to get to that Islamic school. Well, after that point, you're really going to appreciate, you know, that short distance. And maybe you can, you know, next time you're going to appreciate that distance of getting to the Islamic school or even appreciate the Islamic school more that, wow, you know, this is like such a great blessing in my life. And, you know, really um, what we have to work hard to do is not just look around and blame others. I mean, that's the teaching. You know, if you want to change something, we don't just simply look around, feel sorry and blame others for our situation. We have to do whatever we can uh, and that's going to require um, some um, uh, self-reflection and 
and some sacrifice and some change within ourselves to do whatever we can to change our condition. And that way we're not focused on, on everything else around us not being the way we want it to be. That instead, you know, what can we do to make things better? You know, we become more introspective, we become more, um, uh, try to be more and more responsible and that changes our view of the world to be more grateful Then we're not oblivious to our blessings, right? We change, we have a richer insight, a richer life. We have a richer heart, you know, have more um, uh, appreciation for all the blessings that God gave us. And it goes on on page 86, where Allah says uh, in Surah 89, verse 15 and 16, as for man, whenever his Lord tries him by honoring him and bestowing favors on him, he says, my Lord has honored me. Whenever he tries him by restricting his provision, he says, my Lord has humiliated me. So he goes on, Hamza Yusuf goes to explain this. And he says that some people, when they get a lot of wealth, they somehow, they automatically assume that they're favored by God and that somehow they're better than others. And then whenever that is restricted, they feel like God is punishing them, but that's not the point. Hamza Yusuf is saying the reality that people miss is that wealth is a test. Wealth is a test. So the way that we look at things is that it is a test for us to keep trying to have excellent character. Um, so there is a little bit more on this page that I was going to go through, but I know that uh, we've run out of time, really. Um, the, he mentions he mentions uh, a couple of things in this paragraph that I want I wanted to, but maybe we'll we'll go over it another time. But he talks a little bit about carnal desires or shahawat. He talks about, um, you know, eating, you know, the concept of uh, controlling what you eat. He also talks a little bit about sexual intimacy and uh, managing your sexuality, which is a topic I think that we do need to talk about at some point with the youth. And I would like to give it the time that it really deserves. But these are some concepts um, that we really have to uh, consider in our self-control, right? So you manage your physical health and your physical well-being, you manage uh, in an effort to manage your spirituality, part of that is sexuality, and there's a lot of advice and guidelines which Islam gives in our religion to help us achieve that and to stay uh, within the bounds that Allah has given us. I feel like at this point, like I'm not going to be able to give that enough time, so maybe I'll save that for another day, inshallah. Um, let's see, there were a few more examples, here. There were a few more examples uh, just talking about uh, short-term, uh, so, you know, there's an example of what's going on with the sound here. Okay, let's see. Even though I muted everybody, but uh, let me just do that again. Okay, so, um, yeah, there's an example here about a child, you know, children. There's a study where some children left, uh, some researchers left cookies on a table, and they told children they can either have one cookie now or two cookies later. So the children who did better on the intelligence test waited and got the two cookies. And then later, after 30 years, those are also the same people who got the long-term um, you know, uh, results. They were better adjusted in life, better educated, more successful in their family. So this is just an example that was given there. <coughs> Let's see. Okay, almost done. Uh, the last point that he made in that uh, section is a is is a nice point and we talked about it yesterday and it's the concept of being zahid or ascetic um being zahid uh, it doesn't mean a lack of material possession but there is an asceticism of the heart okay in which one is not attached to the material world and is indifferent to it right so have you ever heard this term where and i, I also learned it from hamza yusuf because he had this amazing uh, seminar in 2005, and I literally attended the same one in Dallas, and I went and attended the same one in Houston. It's like a one weekend one. Um, but he taught us that you should keep the dunya in your hand and not in your heart. So what does that mean? If you keep something in your hand and not in your heart, then what happens? That means that you are not letting that affect your very core spirituality. You are able to do what you need to do with that, right? Utilize it, you know, uh, bring good from it, but you don't let it control you or destroy you, or you don't get so attached to that thing that it, it really, over, you know, controls you and overtakes and, and forces you to do the wrong thing. You know, if you have dunya in your hand, that's what you want. Okay. It's okay to have as much dunya. Yes, we're going to play Kahoot. Somebody's asking. I, I'll, I'll finish. Uh, that'll be my last point. So, um, you know, uh, he gave a beautiful example that some, you know, he gave an example of a lady who, 
there's a lady who had like no dunya in her hand, but she had dunya in her heart. It's like, that's what drove her. That's what she was so attached to. Her heart was so full of dunya, you know, that it was in her heart, even though she didn't have dunya in her hand. There's that example. And then there's people who have dunya in their hand, but they don't have it in their heart. And that's what we want to be. And so I just wanted to, um, and someone's requesting the Kahoot, so I don't want to uh, take any more of your time. The Kahoot is super short because it's like repeating the same uh, points over and over, but um, I really appreciate all of your time today. I'm going to, um, inshallah, try to share my screen. And Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Asma, are you going to play? Let me share my screen. So, here we go. So, um, the game pin is 5071822, 5071822. This is all about the concepts. Welcome, Aisha, Maliha, Hania. Y'all are my girls here, Asma. Noor, ZA. I know Asma would probably want me to. No, I, nothing. Hey, Asma, you didn't do what you said you were going to do. Is, is, uh, Coco no, okay, that's fine. We, earlier, Coco was here, but that's the cat. But Coco's not here right now. All right, guys, let us begin. You ready? Ah. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start. So here, question number one. Number one, what helps you soften the heart and get closer to Allah? Is it a meat tenderizer, a rocket ship from NASA, remembering death or none of the above? What helps you soften your heart and get closer to Allah? That's right, remembering death is what helps you soften your heart and get closer to Allah. We talked about that in the very beginning. Good job, girls. Aisha, Maliha, Hania, Lana, and Maya. The next one, number two. The Prophet Muhammad said, increase the remembrance of what? The eliminator of your brother and sisters, the eliminator of pleasures, the eliminator of homework, or the beginning of pleasures? What did the Prophet say? Increase the remembrance of? Very good. The eliminator of pleasures. We talked about these in the beginning today, the hadith. Very good. You guys are still doing good. Hania, Aisha, Maliha, Maryam, and Asma. All right, number three, the prophet also said, be in this life as a what? Winner, stranger or traveler, a joker or none of these? How should you live this life? Very good, as a stranger or a traveler, that's how you should live this life. And good job, Aisha Malia, Mariam, Asma, and Hania, next. Number four, take advantage of five before five includes what before what? Wealth before poverty, life before death, health before illness, or all of the above? Take advantage of five before five, and that includes what? Excellent, so it's all of those things. So you take advantage of those five things before it is too late. I know everybody's a winner today, everybody did great, mashallah. Asma did good, mashallah, three out of four. Mariam did great, mashallah, four out of four, and all of you guys did great, mashallah. Maliha, Maliha and Maria, mashallah, what's going on? Aisha and Lana, you guys did great too. Mashallah, congratulations. And I am going to stop the share and we'll do a quick dua. Jazakumullahu khairan for your awesome um, presence and for joining in. And inshallah, we're doing good to finish up our curriculum. Uh, Y'all are gonna be really good. We're gonna be done with this book and done with Hamza Yusuf's book and then some, inshallah. Uh, so you guys are doing amazing, mashallah. So let's do a quick dua. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfir wa tubu ilayk wa al-asr inna al-insana la fi khusr inna al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil-haqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr inshallah. We will see you here tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <laughs>